Stanford University. So welcome to lecture 18 of CS193G. Um, this will be our last lecture for the class. Next time we'll have our poster session where we'll look at all of your awesome results from your class projects next Thursday. Um, for the posters, actually, we would really uh, like it if you could send Niels uh, uh, the source of your posters kind of before or right after the poster session so that if we you know, either don't get around uh, to wa watching your poster, or you can't actually make it, or we just don't have enough time and, you know, couldn't jot down all the information so we can have a reference of what you actually did. And, um, yeah. And so with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our last guest speaker for the quarter, Michael Garland. Uh, he got his PhD from CMU, was a faculty member at UIUC, and is now in the video research group doing research on parallel algorithms, languages for parallel programming, and uh, kind of higher level um, abstractions and how to lower them to CUDA and beyond. And today he's going to be talking to us about sorting and how to do it efficiently on GPUs. With that, Michael Garland. Thanks. Yeah, so the topic I, did, I, I well, negotiated to discuss today was, uh, was parallel sorting. And this is, a, this is an algorithm area that I've done some work on, and it's sort of a, a fundamental kind of algorithm area for a lot of problems that you might want to solve in parallel. It's also an area that, you know, it, it goes way back, right? I mean, the, the early work on sorting goes back to well before I was born. You can find papers in, from the 60s that are still very relevant today. So I'm going to cover a very, very small section of this, this whole field. And I'm actually not going to talk too much about uh, low-level efficiency issues or, you know, low-level code optimization issues. I wanted to focus more on the higher-level algorithmic issues and, and how you might think about how to design a sorting algorithm. Because I think, at least for people who aren't likely to implement high-performance sorts, that's probably more relevant than the, the really low-level details anyway. Um, just so I know, who's, who's actually ever implemented any kind of sorting code before? Uh, I don't care about parallel, just like some kind of sorting code. And, and, and who's implemented like parallel sorting code? Anybody? Okay, good. So I'm going to teach you something, I, I hope. Um, <clears throat> so uh, first I want to define kind of what kind of sorting problem I want to talk about today. And I want to talk about a fairly simple kind of sorting problem, which is simply, you know, if we're given some sequence of integers, which I'm, I'm usually going to refer to as keys, um, we want to shuffle them around so that they're in non-decreasing order. And you know, optionally, you might like it that the sort algorithm that you use preserves uh, keys of equal value in their original order. So if, if you look at this, uh, you know, there's two nines in that input sequence. And in the sorted output, the red one is still before the green one. Uh, people, when they're describing sorting algorithms, they would usually refer to that as being a stable sorting algorithm. It's stable in the sense that the order of equivalent keys is stable. Uh, there are some sorts that are unstable, which don't preserve this property. So when, if, if I say unstable, I don't mean that, you know, the code is fragile and might break or something. I mean that it might potentially reorder equal keys. And sometimes you care and sometimes you don't. So that's why I'm characterizing it as optional. Um, there are many things that I am not going to talk about today. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on a very specific sorting problem, which is uh, I'm only going to talk about sorting integers. And normally, I'm going to assume that those are, say, 32 bits, right? So fixed length, word size integers. Um, I'm going to only really focus on sorting sequences of numbers. So that they're only sequences of keys. They're not keys in some larger record of you know, some database of, of students or something like that. Um, I'm going to assume that sequences, you know, they're all living in memory. They're not so big that they don't fit in, in RAM. And when, when I talk about main memory, I am basically going to mean whichever memory happens to be attached to the processor that I'm talking about. So the CPU, if I talk about CPU sorts, the data that they're sorting is sitting in the CPU system memory. If I mention GPU sorts, the data is already sitting in the GPU memory. So I'm going to show you some performance data later. This is on the GPU, and this is all for data that's already sitting in the GPU memory. I'm going to completely ignore any issue about moving data around. 
Uh, and I'm not going to talk about various things. So sorting is actually a pretty wide field, and there's many kinds of sorting problems you might want to address. And these are just some examples of issues you might want to deal with, which I'm not going to talk about at all. Right? So you might need some kind of, you might need to sort data that's bigger than memory. And people would usually refer to that as external memory sorting. And you need to do things a little differently if, if all your data doesn't fit in main memory. Uh, there's obviously distributed sorting problems, where I have, say, a cluster of 1,000 machines. Each one of the machines have so, has some portion of the data, and I need to kind of sort my data all across the cluster at once. So that, say, you know, every machine has a contiguous set of keys from the entire sequence. I'm not going to talk about that at all. Uh, I'm also not going to talk about very long or variable length keys, right? So I'm not talking about sorting strings of, say, names. I'm talking about just sorting integers to simplify things. And there's many others that I could tell you that I'm not going to tell you about. Right? So I want to focus on a fairly simple problem because that makes it tractable to tell you some interesting things about it in the space of this lecture. Um, now you might wonder, why would we want to do sorting in the first place? And there's actually various reasons why you might want to. Um, you might want to do it just because you need to put data in some order, right? So if I have a list of people that work for me in a company, maybe I need to sort them alphabetically to report information to the IRS. Um, a common reason to sort data is because it makes searching for individual things easier if you happen to know the data is sorted. Um, but an, another important reason, and actually if, if, if you're implementing any kind of interesting data structures in the projects you're working on, you might have already encountered this is that a lot of times, if you're trying to build some sort of data structure in parallel, if you happen to have a, a sort available, that's often a convenient way to build data structures. So building spatial data structures of points that are floating in space, it's, it's kind of easy to formulate that as a sorting problem. Uh, if you have a, a matrix representation that's just a big bag of non-zero entries, if you sort them by their, uh, their row index, you get basically an adjacency list kind of representation of, of the matrix or graph. If you sort them by column, you've effectively transposed the matrix. A lot of data structure manipulations can be reduced to sort. So it's a, it's a convenient primitive to have available if you want to build data structures in parallel. Might not necessarily be the most efficient way to implement any particular data structure, but it's a, it's a handy place to start. So that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm particularly interested in sorting is I want to use it to, say, build spatial data structures. Okay, so the, the fundamental question then is, how do we sort stuff? Right. Um, so you people who have written some sorting code before, what, what kind of sorting methods have you implemented or, or do you know about? Quick sort. Quick sort is a common one, yes? Merge, Merge sort is a good one, yes? Bubble sort, Bubble sort. yes. That's, usually, that's often the first one people talk about, right? Heap sort, yes. Okay, so all good, all good sorts, and I'm going to talk about some of them. Um, so to start at the beginning with sort of the most simple kinds of sorts, ones that aren't even particularly efficient necessarily, um, a lot of people start with, say, selection sort. Right? So I could take the, the sequence of keys that I have, and I could repeatedly remove the smallest key from the input and append it to the output. And just continue doing that until I've removed every key. Right, so it's called selection because I'm repeatedly selecting the smallest key and then copying it to the output. Uh, kind of the opposite of that is what people usually refer to as insertion, which is, well, I could keep my output in sorted order and I could repeatedly take the next key, say, from the front of the input sequence, find out where it falls within the out sorted output and then insert it at that position. And just keep doing that until I've consumed all the keys. Now, those two methods are very simple. If you look at their asymptotic complexity, they're basically quadratic methods. And they also happen to be basically sequential methods. They're, they're, you could imagine some parallelism here. So for instance, the problem of find the smallest key in the input. I could solve that in parallel by doing a reduction, for instance, right? a, a, re, a min reduction. But that doesn't introduce a whole lot of parallelism, and this is not going to be a particularly good parallel sort. One of the other really simple sorts, and bubble sort is essentially a version of this, uh, is what I would, I would call transposition. And that is, I can just look at my sequence and find a pair of adjacent elements that are out of order, right? where AI is bigger than AI plus one. And if I find any such pair that's out of order, I can just flip them, swap their 
swap their positions. And if I just keep doing that until there are no inverted pairs, then I'm done. So bubble sort, which someone mentioned, I, I forget who mentioned it, is a particular strategy that does the, you look for swapped pairs in a particular order. Right? You kind of scan through the list sequentially and keep doing that until there are none. Um, so while the, the two simple ones at the top are basically sequential methods, there's fairly little parallelism except for the reduction to find the smallest key and so forth. Uh, transposition, you can actually parallelize pretty easily. And uh, one way to do that, which is a, a handy way to know about, is what, what is often called odd-even transposition sort. Or sometimes people just call it odd-even sort. And the idea is this. I have, say, all my elements, and I can assign one thread or one processor, if we were talking about a, a, more, a more general system, to every element. And now I want to look for pairs that are out of order, and I want to swap them. And I also need to make sure that there's no contention amongst processors. So what I'm going to do is alternate phases where I look at every odd element and swap it with its adjacent even element if they're out of order, and then look at every even element and swap it with its neighbor if they're out of order. And that alternating phases of odd even guarantees that no two threads are ever looking at the same values. Right? So that, that eliminates any possibility for contention. So the odd even transposition sort that you can implement in parallel is actually very simple, right? You just have a loop, you continue while it's not sorted, and you can either do that explicitly or you can just prove that, well, it's gonna take at most n over two iterations of this loop, so I could just iterate n over two times and not worry about whether it's sorted or not. And then with each one, I have e basically two phases. Every thread will look at its element and its adjacent element, ai and ai plus one, and if they're out of order, swap. And the only difference between the two phases is is every thread looking at an odd element and its successor, or an even element and its successor. And obviously I need a barrier in between these phases, because I need to make sure that every, every thread in, say, this odd phase has done its swapping before any thread proceeds to the even phase. So that's a lot like bubble sort, if you've ever implemented bubble sort before. But instead of linearly scanning over the array, I'm in parallel looking at all the odd pairs and all the even pairs. And repeating. Yes? It depends. You, you could do either, right? So, so you could do it n over two times, right? Because it requires n phases, but there's two phases per iteration. So you could do it n over two times, or you could explicitly look for, am I sorted? If so, stop. Um, and you could imagine doing either. I've, I've, I've implemented both. And whether it's a good idea, I would say probably depends on uh, how big the sequence is. So if you want to know, you know, am I sorted or not, you will probably wind up having to do a reduction there, right? You're going to compute a per thread predicate to decide whether I'm all sorted or not, and then have to do a reduction. So the answer to your question, do I want to actually check if I'm sorted or just blindly go ahead, depends on what is the cost of doing this reduction of are all the elements sorted. If reduction is cheap, then you might as well go ahead and do it. If reduction is expensive, then you might be better off just doing n over two iterations. So, as with most performance questions, the answer is it depends. <laughs> so does this, this make sense? And uh, I'll, I should mention, I'm not showing you this purely for pedagogical reasons either. There, although it is essentially a quadratic sort, at small sequence sizes, you know, say like 16 elements or something, this might actually be a good idea compared to some other kinds of sorts. Uh, but it is a quadratic method, essentially, in terms of the amount of work it does. Uh, you're going to do up to n over 2 iterations of this loop, and you have essentially order n work inside each loop. So you're going to do a quadratic amount of work. So we'd like to do a bit better than that. And there are, of course, many ways that you could do better than that. Uh, the way that I want to focus on is actually uh, based on counting and doing radix sort. So here's another very simple sort, which I'll call counting sort. The idea is that for every element of the array, I can just count how many elements should be to its left in the sorted output. And then once I know that, I simply write the element into that position. So this quantity, how many elements sort to my left, people often refer to as rank. So that's what I'm calling it up here at the top. And 
the question of how many elements sort to my left is simply, if I look in the input sequence, um, I'm, I'm trying to make this a stable sort. So I look at all my elements that are currently to my left, and any element that is to my left and less than or equal to AI, it should remain on my left in the sorted sequence. Right? And if it's to my right and it's less than AI, it also should be to my left in the sorted sequence. And the reason that I have less than or equal to on the left and less than on the right is that I want to preserve the relative ordering of equivalent keys. If I didn't care about that, I could just do less than on each side. And that, well, actually, that would, that, depending upon how you implement it, that might actually fail. <laughs> so anyway, I can compute this count, this rank, for every element in the sequence. And obviously, I can do that in parallel, right? Each element can be processed independently. And essentially, for each element, I could assign a thread that scans over all the elements of the input sequence and counts up how many should come before AI in the output. And then once I've computed that, I simply need to do this permutation. I take every element and I write it to the position in the output that I computed, which I'm storing in this array I'm calling rank I. So do you believe that this works? It makes sense? It's a, it's a very obvious sorting algorithm, right? You just count up how many things are less than me, and then I write. This is also a, a quadratic sort, right? Because I have n elements, and each one of them is going to scan all n in input elements. So I'm doing a, a quadratic amount of work. So this is also a simple quadratic sort. Now, there's a, there's a slight reformulation of this kind of algorithm that's actually a little more useful in explaining the more efficient sort that I'm going to get to shortly. And that is, instead of computing my output, uh, my position in the sorted output directly, I can think about it instead as saying, how many positions do I need to move to my left to get from where I am right now to my correct position in the sorted output? And if you think about that, what I need to do is, if I'm, if I'm AI, I need to know how many people to my left are bigger than me. And that's the number of steps I should take to the left if I imagine sort of filtering all these elements to their appropriate position. For every element to my right that's smaller than me, I actually would need to take a step to the right. Yeah, because those guys need to go to my left. So if I take, if my goal is to figure out how many steps I need to take to the left, it's how many things to my left are bigger than me minus how many things to my right are smaller than me. And that will give me either a positive number if I need to move to the left or a negative number if I need to move to the right. And then I can move to my final position by just saying move the element at AI to AI minus this offset value that I've computed. So that's basically equivalent to the, the other form I just showed you. Every element, if there's a one thread per element, each one of them is going to scan all n input values. It's going to test them for greater than or less than, and I'm going to compute this offset and then I'm going to scatter. So I haven't really changed the complexity of it all. I've just kind of reorganized how I think about it, from computing my output position to computing an offset that I need to move in the array. So is this making sense? You believe me that this actually works, assuming I, I didn't make any typos. So this again is quadratic, but um, the special case of this is actually the key to understanding radix sort, which is actually an efficient sort. Uh, and that's binary counting sort. So suppose that every one of the values in this array is either 0 or 1. So I'm calling it binary. Right? So I'm only considering 0, 1 sequences. If I take the counting sort algorithm I just told you about and I specialize it to the binary case, I have two cases that are relevant. Either AI is 0 or it's 1. Right? And again, I want to compute how many positions do I need to move to my left in, to get to my correct sorted position. So if I'm 0, what I need to know, what I need to know is how many 1s are to my left. Right? Because in the sorted sequence, all the zeros will be on the left and all the 1s will be on the right. Yeah. So if I'm a 0, I need to move to the left a number of steps, which is the number of ones to my left, because they all need to move to my right. And if I'm a one, I actually need to move to the right 
by the number of positions, which is how many zeros come after me. The, 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 the second step, which is this permutation, is exactly the same as before. Right? I've computed this offset for every element, and the only difference is that I have kind of a special case of how to compute it. Instead of doing less than or equal to tests, since all I'm dealing with are numbers that are 0 or 1, I just have to count up how many zeros, how many ones. How many ones to my left, how many zeros to my right. Does it seem reasonable? Now this is, a, this is an example of something that we could actually compute pretty efficiently in parallel. So I would say, for instance, that if, if for every element, AI, I want to count how many ones are to my left, uh, I think you already know how to do that. Do you guys know how to do that? Scan, right? So, Imagine that you know, I have these ones and zeros, and I want to count how many ones are to my left. I can just do a scan, right, a prefix sum, of all those ones. And the result I get from the scan will be precisely how many ones are to my left. And similarly, if I wanted to count all the zeros to my right, I can uh, just flip all these bits right, and do a reverse scan from right to left. And that will tell me how many zeros are to my right. Or alternatively, I could take the number of ones and the total number of uh, ones and zeros and, and do a little arithmetic if I wanted to save some time. But that's, that's kind of an unimportant detail at, at the moment. So this problem I can solve with scan. Uh, and in general, I can solve it with two scans. A forward scan of the ones and a reverse scan of the flipped bits. So if I do that, it actually lets me implement an efficient sort. Um, so this is a, a radix sort that is implemented in a Python kind of pseudocode. Um, the, the box that I've highlighted here is the relevant box. This is the code that implements the binary counting sort that I just told you about. So if you look at the, the pieces of this, you know, I have some input A. Uh, the keys all consist of some number of bits which say by default is 32. Um, and then what I need to do is sort to sort, I can apply binary counting sort to the least significant bit, so bit zero, reorder all the keys, and then apply that to bit one, and bit two, and bit three, and bit four, and so forth until I get to the, the final bit. Now, um, if you haven't encountered radix sort algorithms before, it might be non-obvious to you that that even works at all. It seems a little weird that if you sort individually by the digits alone, from least significant to most significant, that that act would actually sort all the numbers. But it is actually true. And it is actually one of the, the oldest kind of sorting methods, right? Like mechanical card sorting machines used to do this sort of thing. So what you see in this, this algorithm is I'm going to loop over all the bits starting from bit zero, the least significant bit. And I'm going to, what this is doing is extracting one bit from the key, right? I'm, I'm taking my key, I'm shifting it by some amount, and masking off all the bits except the one I care about. And then I'm doing these two scans. This scan will compute the number of ones to the left of every element. And this one, this reverse scan of the flipped bits, that's what this, this f caret 1 is doing in XOR, right? So that's flipping the bits. This reverse scan is computing the number of zeros to the right of every element. And once I've computed that, I can just construct all these offsets as I showed you and then do a permutation. And then I repeat that for every digit. This kind of in words is roughly what I'm doing. Right? Um, I am applying this counting sort to successive digits from least to most significant. And I am performing a scatter in each step. And here, the, I'm looking only at binary digits. I could imagine looking at digits of some higher radix, but binary digits. So this is a little more complicated. Does this make sense? You have any questions about my, my 
overall algorithm here. So the interesting question, I think, is, is this an efficient sorting method? Um, and, and probably the even more interesting meta question is, how should I even think about the question of, is this efficient? Um, so what, what, what's your reaction? If I asked you, if, is, is this efficient? Does it seem like it's an efficient method? How would you, how would you analyze whether it's efficient or not? And, and more importantly, whether you could do better. Any thoughts on that? You could, you could look at it at what it does asymptotically. So if, if you think about that, um, if I assume that the number of bits in the key is fixed, if it's a constant, and for all practical purposes, I'm going to just assume it's 32, right? then the, you could implement this in a way that did linear work. It would be order n instead of n squared. So that always sounds good. right? Um, it's at least promising that this might be efficient. If you, were to, if you were to think about what the potential bottlenecks in an algorithm like this would be, what, what would your, be your suspicion about what is slow in this algorithm? Sorry? The scan? Why, why would you suspect the scan is slow? Okay, well, yeah, I mean, there's only a few lines, so guessing is, is actually a pretty good strategy, right? Randomized algorithms are actually extremely helpful in parallel, so it's, it's sort of good to think in that direction. Um, a scan, uh, well, it, of course, it depends on how well the scan is written. But if the scan is very well written, that's not really the bottleneck. You mean the, the rearrangements with this permute? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the permute, so here, this permute that you're doing, right, you're taking all the elements and you compute some position to send them to, and then you just permute them randomly all over, all over the world. Um, on, on most architectures, that's likely to be a pretty slow thing, right? Most machines, whether GPU or CPU or what have you, like coherence in the, the data access patterns that you have. And if you think about the way I've, I've designed this algorithm, I'm doing 32 of these steps, right, for a 32-bit key. So 32 times I'm going to pick up all the data, I'm going to do these scans, and then I'm going to do this global permutation. And generally speaking, that permutation is fairly expensive. I mean, the scan is not a trivial cost either. So what I'd like to do to make this more efficient is actually to reduce the number of times I need to go through these steps, the number of iterations I need to take, and consequently the number of permutations I need to perform. So if I wanted to reduce the number of permutations, um, do you have any theories about what kind of strategy I might adopt to reduce the number of times I need to go through this loop? divide and conquer, but instead of doing binary, you treat these as integers, huh. and you just take some, set some integer, and then you do the same process, but you're separating everything less than the integer and greater than the integer, and then sort the first, and this is sort of, if you can sort of do this in a uh, that, log in sort of way. Yeah, so that, uh, you could do that. That would be uh, essentially an entirely different algorithm, though, right? So that, that would be more like, a, almost like a quick sort in, in, uh, in its design. Or an MSB rating sort. Yeah, so you could, you could do that. And um, if, if you have a good idea of what the distribution of keys is, that can actually be a, a very good strategy. Right? So if, if I happen to have a good handle on the range of keys, and the range of keys is small, and I can easily pick one that would divide them all in half or something like that, then that's actually a pretty good situation. And that sort of strategy can be pretty efficient. If I don't happen to have a good idea of what the distribution of keys is, and I can't easily pick an integer to split all the data, 
then I might have a problem, right? So if, for instance, I assume that all I know is I have 32-bit integers, and so I'm going to pick, you know, the midpoint of 0 to 2 to the 32 minus 1 as my integer to split with, and all my keys are actually in the range 0 to 8, then um, it's going to be a while before I do any productive work splitting them with these very big integers, right? Um, so in general, that's a little difficult, but if you know the distribution, then actually that, that's good. Yeah? There's some way to virtually permute them. I don't know exactly how you do that, but to have some Virtually buffer. permute things, yeah. You mean other than using some kind of quantum tunneling through space-time? <laughs> uh, well, what do you mean by virtually, exactly? I mean, like, if you could have another buffer, and I haven't gone through it, but if you have some other storage that holds what the position would be, uh, so you, you're thinking that you could, instead of actually moving all the data, you could kind of accumulate the permutations, and uh, if you combined multiple permutations, then you'd be better off. Am, am I kind of describing your idea? <clears throat> yeah, so you, you could imagine doing that. One problem with that is that, um, you know, that I'm the thing I'm waving my hands about, like accumulate the permutations and combine them and then do the counting, you're going to wind up having to do indirections through this permutation vector that you're accumulating. And so what, all you've done is transmute uh, a permutation of stores into a bunch of indirect loads. Now it might be that loads, it might be that sort of, uh, you know, incoherent loads are a lot faster than incoherent stores on some particular machine. And that might actually improve things. But that kind of depends on the specifics of the machine. Yeah? Um, as we go through this process and get some more uh, closer to the most significant bit, do we get any kind of, um, when we permute, are we permuting by sort of greater than some minimum distance? Because now we're permuting by larger bits. I'm trying to think. Is, is there any way uh, you can You mean sort of, sort of the size of the step you're taking? Yeah. Do we know if we're sort of permuting in some sort of bin, larger uh, or less number of bins? Uh, it's, it's hard to predict without knowing what the data is. Yeah. Right? You, you, could, you could construct data that had fairly uniformly, you know, fairly well behaved um, scatter patterns and you could construct data that was just awful. That kind of depends. Um, so actually, you know, the, the idea of trying to combine multiple permutations together is sort of the thing you want to do, but the way you want to think about it is actually fairly different from the way I described it. <laughs> so instead of trying to explicitly, you know, compute a bunch of binary permutations and somehow combine the permutations, what you actually want to do is stop looking at a single bit at a time and start looking at multiple bits at a time. So um, to go back to my example here, you can describe right sort in terms of looking at, uh, say, you know, B bit digits at a time. Right? And what I showed you was look at one bit at a time, do this counting sort, permute, and repeat. I could look at two bits at a time, or I could look at four bits at a time, and treat that as a digit, and compute an aggregate permutation based on that. Um, so, to give you an example, I won't show you the code for that, but um, if you think about, uh, let's say, I want to look at four, bit, four bits at a time, right? So the possible values of the digits I'm looking at are 0 through 15. Now, I no longer want to know, uh, say, how many ones are to my left. What I want to know, again, going back to my original counting sort uh, example, I need to know uh, how many things to my right and left are bigger or smaller than me. Right? But I can do that pretty easily when I know that, say, I'm only looking at 16 different values. In particular, I can think about it in terms of, say, building a, a histogram for the keys in the sequence. So suppose that... Um, I, I build a, a histogram where I have 16 buckets in my histogram. And I record in each bucket the number of keys whose digit is that bin, right? So I have 0 through 15, 16 different bins. 
So for, for, every, for every element of the sequence, what I need to know is um, how many elements are there with a digit smaller than me? Right? And how many people to my left have the same digit as me? That describes all the keys that should be to my left. Right? So everyone who's smaller than me and everyone who's equal to me and already to my left. That is who should be to my left in the sorted sequence. Right? So again, I can actually compute this with uh, reductions and prefix sum. Right? So I can, by reduction, I can compute this histogram. Right? Sum up the number of elements of every digit that are in the sequence. And the number of elements to my left with the same digit, I can compute just with prefix, uh, prefix sum per bin, essentially, right? I need one prefix sum per digit. So I can reduce the number of uh, steps in this algorithm I need to take by increasing the size of the digit that I'm looking at from one bit to multiple bits. And that actually is a good way to improve the performance, and it also lets you, um, it lets you build a more efficient sort as well, because what I haven't talked about so far is how would I divide up the work in this algorithm between different blocks in a kernel, say, right? And if you're gonna implement a CUDA kernel, one of the main things you need to think about is what does each block do? And if I look at um, my, my pseudocode for this radix sort algorithm, each one of these, uh, you know, the scan, this reverse scan, and this permute, these are global operations, right? There's no subdivision of labor between different blocks. What I'd like to do is somehow split up the work. Well, obviously, if my implementation of scan is good, then it is behind the scenes, carving up work into blocks and, and doing interesting things that way. But I, I'm not seeing that. So what I'd like to be able to do is think about how can I carve up the task into something that individual blocks can do, and then I can accumulate the results across all the blocks. And actually, this, this view of radix sort in terms of histograms is kind of a nice way to think about how to do that. I could imagine uh, Suppose I have a kernel, and I can divide up my sequence into tiles of some fixed size. You know, pick, pick some number, like uh, say 1024. And I can have individual thread blocks of a kernel process these individual tiles. And in particular, what I can do is build one of these histograms that I was talking about, right? The number of keys in that tile that have a, that have a particular digit in the place that I'm looking in. And then what that would produce is a table of histograms. Right? So the, the bins of these histograms are the digits that I'm looking at. And say the rows here are the different blocks. So again, for a particular element, what I need to know is uh, globally, how many elements are there with keys smaller than me, which I can get by summing up all these ones. Say, if, if my digit is three, I need to sum up all the, el the entries for zero, one, and two. And then everyone before me. So if I'm in this block number two, I need to know how many elements in tile zero and one also have a three. And the total, the total number of all the things in all these blocks plus these ones in threes that are before me, that is um, the global position at which I'm going to need to write the element, or the base for the, write the element, and then I need to locally do the same computation within the block. Right? So within this individual block, I would need to compute the same kind of histogram value. Um, and one nice thing about it, if you think about that, that I can, again, I can perform that computation with scan. If I take these histograms and I write them out in column major order, right? So if I write 
all this entire column and then this entire column and then this entire column, then this, this value that I've been describing is simply a prefix sum over that linearized column major representation of these histograms. So that's a little brief, and I, but I don't want to show you the CUDA code because I didn't bring it with me and it's a little more complicated than would fit on one slide. Does it make sense or is this uh, seem fishy and suspicious? Does it seem suspicious? It looks like it is. It's fine. So again, I, I, don't, I don't particularly want to emphasize the low-level details, but when I, what I want to emphasize is the fact that you can think about the algorithm in terms of kind of high-level operations like scan and permute here in my pseudocode. But then you can also think about how can I break that up into individual blocks of work and then combine them. And here, the way to break that up into individual blocks of work is to compute per block histograms, right, which mimics the global computation, and then combine them by, in this case, summing together the columns. Now, I'm not showing you the code, but I did bring some performance data with me of the code that you could see if you wanted to see it. Um, so what I'm showing here is just some performance data measuring the, uh, what I'm calling the sorting rate of a radix sort implemented in this way on various GPUs. So the way to read this graph is I generated random sequences with varying numbers of, uh, in this case, key value pairs. Right, so that's the x-axis down here. And then I measured the time to sort them and I computed the sorting rate, which is simply the, the size of the sequence divided by the running time. And I am reporting that in millions. So this, uh, this block right here, that is running at about, say, 40, 45 million items per second is the way to read this table. So what you would expect, since this is a a linear, I'm, I'm claimed that this is a linear method, right? What you would expect of this sorting rate is that it should level off to a roughly flat throughput as the sequence gets large, right? Because the, the, I'm taking size divided by time. So if running time is proportional to n, then n over running time should approach some constant if things were reasonable. And roughly you see that behavior. One of the reasons that I, that I put this slide in, uh, in here is that <clears throat> we, we at NVIDIA have uh, often tried to emphasize that CUDA provides a programming model for scalable parallel computing. And I actually wanted to test whether that was indeed true. So we implemented this radix sort and I ran it on uh, a variety of GPUs. So I don't know how familiar you are with our product line, but the GTX 280 was prior to the release of our new Fermi cards, the highest, well, it was later su superseded, I guess, by the 285. But this was at the time I measured this data, a high-end GPU. And an 8600 GTS was a pretty low-end GPU. And the other ones were kind of in the middle. So this represents running the same code across a span of pretty considerable different number of GPUs, uh, both in terms of size. This one's quite a bit smaller than the GTX 280 in terms of the number of multiprocessors. And also uh, generation, right? So if you look in here, the 8800 Ultra was a, a G80 processor. Um, the 9800 GTX Plus was a G92 processor. GTX 280 is a GT200 processor. Released over the span of a, of a couple years. And if you look at the kind of performance we get, it is actually scaling reasonably from you know, fairly small GPUs, which deliver a relatively small level of throughput, 
to large GPUs, which gen, uh, provide a much higher level of throughput. And uh, I, I don't have a slide showing the numbers, but I actually did an additional experiment on this data. I took, uh, for each one of these processors, I took the, the peak gigaflops and peak gigabytes per second that we quote on our product literature. And I computed the ratio between the peak for the GTX 280 and the peak for everybody else. And then I took the GTX 280 numbers and I scaled it by that ratio and took the smaller one, the more pessimistic one, right? And compared that to the actual data that I measured. Surprisingly, that, that very um, largely unfounded computation, right? Uh, was a pretty good predictor of the data that I actually measured. It was in, within about 10% in most cases. So I took that as a good sign that in fact, well first of all, the, the program I wrote was indeed scalable and the style in which it was written and the, the, the CUDA programming environment was in fact delivering scalable parallel programs. In terms of absolute numbers, um, these performance data have been superseded by other methods. Um, by various people, including Dwayne, who's sitting right over here. Um, but the, the main message I would actually take away from this, other than the fact that these numbers are big, right? I mean, we're talking about hundreds of million, 100 million plus items per second, so it's not like this is a terrible implementation. <coughs> but it's also scaling quite well across generations, which I find encouraging. Yes. Um, on the high end there, with, say, take the 9800 GTX. Yeah. We're seeing that. Um, sorry, not, not sinusoidal. It's, you know, it's sort of it's a. kind of sawtoothy thing. Yeah. Are we seeing binning effects due to. Is that. That seems a bit big just to associate with threads and blocks and. Voice. Yeah, so that, that's an interesting question. Um, what you're seeing there is actually an alternation between power of two and non-power of two sequence sizes. Um, and I believe that this is reflecting issues relating to the way that DRAM is physically laid out. Right, um, I'm not entirely certain of that. that that's a conjecture. <laughs> okay. But I believe it's because, uh, as I recall, it's the power of two sizes that are actually worse. And I believe that's because, you know, if you look at the way DRAM is actually organized, you know, it's organized in sort of power of two uh, banks or pages or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and you can have some un undesirable artifacts if, uh, if the, you know, the way that you carve up the data aligns in a bad way with the way that DRAM is physically banked and things like that. Um, that's a pattern that, you know, if we implemented it differently, I'm not sure we would see that. And if we ran it on a different architecture like Fermi, I'm not sure we would see that. Um, you know, we don't really see it on GT200. So it's, sometimes you see these ephemeral things and it's difficult to know, you know, what combination of my implementation strategy and the physical characteristics of the hardware is actually responsible for this. And uh, I, I also don't mean to suggest that that's like a GPU thing, right? I mean, if you try and really optimize code on any kind of processor, uh, stuff like this happens, right? Like some combination of the way I implement my code and the cache coherence protocol and whatever kind of NUMA features my multi-core chip has results in this weird thing happening that I can barely explain. Unfortunately, yeah, I mean, once you start to care about really carefully optimizing code, unfortunate things like this happen. <laughs> Optimizing, there might be almost a case where you have, are sorting n numbers, you want to pad that with zeros and sort n plus something not x numbers. You know, is that yeah, yeah, you could pad the data, or you know, uh, actually, I think what would probably have been better is to um, you you could assign an amount of work per block that's not a power of two, right? I said pick 1024. Uh, you could have picked something that's not a multiple of or not a power of two and that would probably have gotten rid of that as well. Um, those are really low level issues that I, I'm, I'm sort of, 
I'm generally against uh, really low-level heroic code optimization, so <laughs> uh, I was more focused on the, the algorithmic aspects of this. But yeah, there's all sorts of once you once you try and focus on maximum performance, there's no end to the weird architectural features of architecture X that you discover, right? For all for all kinds of architecture. Yeah. yeah. It's like thermodynamics. I mean, it, it always gets you in the end. There's always some bad corner case. Other questions about this, this radix sort stuff that I've been showing you? So I imagine some of you are using uh, thrust, for instance, right? I think thrust sort is by default a radix sort for most data types, right? So when, when you actually call sort, it's executing something like this. It's actually derived from this code originally, I think, right? Okay, so I wanted to talk just briefly about a couple other kinds of sorting methods. Um, one of them is merge sort, which I think someone mentioned earlier when I asked you, how might you sort data? Um, you guys have probably taken like computer science classes or whatever where they teach you how to implement merge sort, right? Um, the way, the way uh, many people tend to think about merge sort is something like the following. Uh, I'll take my sequence, I'll split it in half, I'll recursively sort both halves, and then I will merge them with a sequential process that looks like, you know, look at the first element of each of my sorted subsequences, take the smaller one, put it on the output, repeat. And that's a, that's a recursive method that's highly sequential, right? The way that you describe merge is essentially treat the sequences as streams of data where I only ever look at the first element. And if, if that's how you know how to do merge sort, then you might think that merge sort is a fairly inherently sequential method. <clears throat> but it's actually not at all. You can implement parallel merge sorts uh, quite nicely. Um, and the, the way that you need to do that, there, there's sort of two key things that you need to know. First of all, instead of this idea of this recursive bisection of the data that you see in typical sequential recursive merge sorts, you can kind of start uh, from the bottom up. You can say, well, look, I'll just take my data and I'm, I'm going to split it into a bunch of fixed size tiles. And uh, you know, I just picked 256 here because it's a power of two and it's not too big. So suppose I just I carve up my data into 256 element tiles and I sort every one of them using whatever my favorite sorting technique is. Maybe the odd even transposition sort that I showed you or radix sort or you know, whatever. Pick anyone. Now once I've done that, <clears throat> I, I need to merge these all together into the final result. And the way I can do that is with sort of a tree of merges. What I need to do is say take every pair of sorted tiles and merge them. So that's what these, these merges here are indicating, right? I'm taking every one of the four pairs of tiles and doing pairwise merge. And then I need to take the two Subsequent or uh, the two pairs of subsequences resulting from that, and merge those, and finally merge the last two subsequences, and then I'm done. So I, I can have this sort of tree structure of merging. And it also turns out that you can parallelize merge just as well as you can parallelize, say, counting sort. <clears throat> you can rely on things like binary sort and so forth, or sorry, <laughs> binary search and things like that to fairly easily merge tiles of data. Um, I don't really have time to get into those details, but if you want to talk about that afterwards, I'd be happy to tell you more about how that works. Um, but you can, in fact, parallelize these merges in various ways. There's different strategies that you can apply. So this can be parallelized quite effectively. Um, again, just to give you some idea of how it works, this is the performance data, again, the sorting rate for um, um, a merge sort that we implemented. I again measured it on different GPUs and again you can see the kind of behavior that we would like to see. Namely, we see good scaling from very small GPUs to big GPUs. 
And again, the scaling is actually pretty much, pretty well predicted by the ratio of peak throughput of all of these machines. Um, and then I just wanted to mention a couple other important. Oh, yes. Yes. But normally, when I think of rigid start, I think of something that specifically works for integers. Mm -hmm. or do you have a version that works for floats or? <clears throat> um, yes. Yeah, so radix sort. People typically think of radix sort in terms of operating on integers. It actually works perfectly fine for floats with one minor little twist. So if you look at the way uh, IEEE floating point numbers are actually represented, they're bits, right? They are, all the positive numbers are ordered, just like integers. And uh, all the negative numbers are actually ordered. The only, the only difference is that because IEEE floating point uses a sign bit, if you just look at the, the, the bit representation of the floating point numbers, all the negative numbers come after all the positive numbers because their high order bit is one, the sign bit. So actually you can do a really simple thing. Flip the sign bit, treat them as if they were integers, and then flip it back. And uh, you know, tricks like that work perfectly well. So in fact, yeah, the radix sort that we have works on floats. And it works just as well as integers and you pay a you know, small little overhead to actually process floats. Um, for um, the only, the only, the only, so on, on, on machines like our GPUs, radix sort is definitely faster than um, merge sort and stuff for keys like 32-bit integers. So if that's what you're sorting, I would pretty much always use radix sort at the moment. I, I know of no implementation of merge sort or quick sort that's anywhere near competitive with radix sorts, and that's why it's the default in Thrust. Um, so the cases where you want to use something like merge sort or quick sort or some other sort are where you have a comparison operator that you, you, know, you can't trivially map that operation to just sorts of integers. Uh, f uh, for the for large majority of sorting problems you might want to deal with, um, radix sort is perfectly fine. But Sometimes you need comparison-based sorts, and that's one reason to talk about, say, merge sort. But you, yeah, you're right, it's slower. Um, I, don't, I don't believe that this is the optimal, right? So if you, look, if you remember the radix sort graph, it went up to about 160 million, and this is going up to only about 60 million, right? So this is definitely slower. Uh, I don't believe that this is the most optimized merge sort you could imagine implementing, and I think, you, you know, you could do better, uh, but I don't, I'm skeptical that we could actually do as well as radix sort. Although maybe we just haven't had the right idea yet. <laughs> you never know. But yeah, you're right, it is slower. Um, and to, to give you some idea of why it's slower, uh, you're going to build this, this big this big merge tree, right? And every time you have to merge some subsequences, you're going to have to, you know, read some data out of memory, do some operations on it, write it back out, and you wind up moving data in and out of memory fairly frequently if you're talking about large sequences, uh, more than radix sort is doing. So the one of the biggest determining factors in this being slower than radix sort is that this is actually moving data around more than the radix sort is. Um, there is the, you know, there's also the fact that this is, you know, a, in fact, an n log n method. It's not actually linear. But you can see, if you look at the throughput rates, it actually starts to go down as you get to bigger sequences because you're taking uh, n divided by order n log n, and you would expect a sort of one over log n shape out here. Other questions about that? Okay, so I just wanted to mention a couple other methods um, in case you're interested to pursue more details about these. Um, 
there are, of course, more than just a couple more classes of methods, but these are two good class of methods to actually investigate if, if you're ever interested in sorting. So one is um, a class of methods that look like quicksort or a generalization of it that's usually called sample sort. Um, and it's kind of the, the dual of merge sort. So if you think about what, what I'm doing in merge sort, I take my input data and I trivially break it up into tiles, right? Just consecutive 256 element tiles. And then I just sort each one independently. And then all the work happens down in this merge tree, right? All, all the complexity of merge sort is in doing the merging. Uh, quick sort and generalization sample sort flip that around. So the idea of sample sort is something like this. Suppose I, I take my sequence and I randomly pick some number of elements from that sequence. Obviously a small fraction or some constant number, right? Now I take that small set of sample keys and I sort that small set. So I pick that to be small enough so it's easy to sort that small set. Right? And now I can imagine taking that sorted sequence of keys and using them to split up my data into bins. Right? All the elements that are less than the smallest key, all the elements that fall between the smallest key and the second smallest key, and so forth. Right? So I can break up all my keys into piles based on where they fall in this range of sorted samples. So this is kind of like your earlier suggestion of, well, maybe I could just pick an integer and, and use it to split. The difference is I, I, I can also draw those samples from the input rather than just kind of picking integers. But you could imagine doing both, and they have similar characteristics. So there, I wind up constructing a bunch of piles of data that I can then sort each individual pile. But once I've done that, now I know I'm done, right? Because I've split up the keys into piles that consist of contiguous ranges of keys. And so all the work goes into splitting up everybody into contiguous regions. And then at the end, I'm done. I don't need to do any merge. So this is kind of the generalization of quicksort, right? If you're familiar with, with quicksort. With, in quicksort, I would pick one key and I would partition all the data so that everyone less than the key is on the left and everyone else is on the right. Yeah. And then recursively sort both pieces. And sample sort is kind of a generalization of that in that instead of picking one pivot value, I pick a number of sample values and I can partition my elements into multiple piles, each of which I can process separately. So that uh, that's actually can be a pretty effective strategy. And if you look at uh, methods that perform well on large clusters, where you're sorting data that's spread across the entire cluster, the methods that perform there the best tend to be sample sort-like methods. So that's the extent to which I'm going to describe it. But if you're interested in that sort of thing, that is actually a good class of methods to learn about. Uh, and then there's another class of methods that are called sorting networks. And these, these are actually fixed network of comparison operators that if you inject values at the left, they go through this fixed network of comparisons and they come out sorted at the right. There's actually a large number of sorting networks. Um, some of them, some of the most useful and some of the ones that you'll most often see implemented on, on machines like GPUs actually go back to a, a paper that Batcher wrote in 1968, Bitonic sort and odd even merge sort. Those, those can be implemented as actual circuits. Right? That, that's the, the reason they're called sorting networks is because you know, it's essentially a fixed combination of comparator circuit. And, um, but of course, you can also implement it in code. Right? And it's fairly straightforward. Um, I guess to give you some idea that that's actually feasible, um, you know, this is just a piece of code for odd even merge sort that I copied out of you know, a well-known book on sorting. And uh, you know, that took me 10 minutes because I essentially transliterated this particular algorithm into CUDA code. I don't expect you to understand that, but you know, it's, it's short and it was fairly easy to write. Uh, that's really <laughs> all I expect you to get out of that, that brief picture. Um, so these methods are, are also useful methods to know about. 
These uh, tend to be n log squared n methods as opposed to the more efficient order n and order n log n methods. Um, but for smaller sequences, these are often, can often be more efficient than some of the other ones simply because there's fewer decisions to make. You are always doing things in a fixed order of comparisons. Uh, and it turns out on, on SIMD-like machines, they, they often deliver good performance, at least on small sequences. So within a thread block, for instance, sorting networks can be a good option uh, in CUDA programs. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll wrap up my overview of sorting algorithms there. But if you have more questions about any of the particular ones I mentioned, I'd be happy to talk about that. Or if you have any other random questions you'd like to ask, uh, feel free. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.